Yay. All right. Welcome to uh, the March 17th St. Patrick's Day uh, meeting of the Silicon Valley Engineering Leadership Community. Uh, we've got uh, an exciting talk coming up from 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 Peter Bell. Uh, normally in these meetings, we, we have a bit of a, a preamble, just basically going over, we are a volunteer organization. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis, typically the third, a Thursday of every month. And uh, we do have a physical facility that we typically meet at in the San Francisco Bay Area. And as, as we emerge from the pandemic, we hope to go back to it as well as keep on an, an, an online presence. And uh, thanks to Kimberly for bringing up, uh, yeah, Varian is our sponsor uh, of, of the physical facility, uh, and uh, we, we, oh, which is my employer. And we can thank them for both the physical facility as well as about a year and a half of Zoom calls. And also other supporters, uh, I want to click on Mentoring Club. Yeah, uh, Liesl Mendoza works with Silicon Valley Engineering Leadership and um, Mentoring Club. So if you want to be mentored or if you can be a mentor, uh, we want to contact them uh, and, and, and they have a code, as you can see, SVELC, and, and, and that gives people di uh, uh, discounts to be mentored. Also, if you know other people who could benefit from mentoring, let them know about this group. And uh, also, I want to thank Peter Bell because not necessarily tonight, but in general, he has been a huge sponsor for us. He helped pay for our in-person outdoor picnic that we had in December, and we're saving some of his money for the biggest party you've ever seen at Varian whenever this thing is risk manageable to do so. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, and uh, and then our main speaker, as you've just heard, is Peter Bell from the CTO Connection. It's going to talk to us about this environment that we live in now as engineering leaders. How do we deal with the great resignation? How do we deal with hiring? How do we deal with team spirit in in this new world? And uh, Peter, why don't why don't you take it away? That sounds great. And if it's okay with everyone, um, so so to give you a little bit of backstory, uh, I used to be a CTO. I guess I'm still a CTO. I have one developer and a product person. Although, as I mentioned earlier, they're both in Ukraine, so they have other things to worry about than writing software right now. Um, I ran engineering at General Assembly and a number of other tech startups you wouldn't have heard of. And then uh, for a while, I was just doing geeky things, teaching, you know, Git, GitHub, chef puppet ruby basically redis somebody would just be like hey we want to pay money for somebody to teach us some technology i'm like sure i can google that and would fly out and and, and teach the class uh, but for the last few months one of the things i've been doing a lot of is just going to other engineering leaders and saying how are you doing this stuff like i i the, the title is attracting and retaining talent in a hybrid world during the great resignation and i feel that kind of brings all the opportunity and misery just right there into one title, right? It's like, we just thought we're done with COVID, which is great. But then everyone starts talking about the great resignation and, and we're absolutely seeing that. We're seeing attrition up in, in a number of companies because people are done with the pandemic. They're reevaluating what is a good life, what's meaningful. Uh, they're getting extremely competitive economic offers from other companies, sometimes from out the outside the geography. I feel like the companies I feel the worst for are the ones in Ohio who really thought they could pay a senior developer $83,000 a year forever and get away <laughs> with that because it's just not going to work. Um, so can I mention I, something though about this, Peter, please, because I'm trying to stall a few minutes because I'm um, mm. You know, the main program doesn't really start until six and the main speaker doesn't really start till 610, according to the agenda that I published, probably. But the, I just looked at some McKinsey report because I'm working with another company that's hired McKinsey and they're looking at the great resignation. And what they found so interesting is the reason employers think people are leaving are not the same as why people are really leaving. Well, that's not surprising. Uh, yes, so uh, employees, employers think it's about compensation or a better job or 
or poached by another company. But what's really happening is valued by the manager, valued by their organization, a sense of belonging, potential for advancement, caring and trusting teammates and flexible work schedule. You know, I mean, now the, the employees are lined up with employers about work-life balance and manageable workload and engagement, but there's a whole lot of disconnect as well. Well, and I think you're making a really good point. And by the way, everyone, please jump in at any point in time. I would much rather make this a conversation than a, you know, a soliloquy. Uh, and what I, I love about what, what Kimberly said is one of the challenges I think we're facing is saying the good news is that we've all figured out we can work from home, right? There were all those companies that were like, you could never work from home. And then, you know, we got three months into the pandemic. It's like, well, yeah, but you could never do like quarterly planning from home. And then we get six months a year two years and we're like ah oh, turns out we could do all that stuff from home and we just had to just as uh when you move from an in-person environment to a remote first environment you need to bring more precision to your management and your processes right you can't just if you're in person it's real easy you know that Jim is having a trouble with his job because he's crying quietly into his computer every morning and you're probably going to go over and have a word with him and try to figure out what's going on. Um, but we, we, we can now click off our cameras when we start to cry. So we don't get those obvious signals. So it's super important to do just the, the hygiene stuff that I mean, I was kind of a digital nomad. I know 15 years ago, I was working out of the United Kingdom and Australia and Thailand with uh, clients in the US. So I've been doing kind of remote and remote first for a long time. And there's just simple things you have to do it. Uh, my version of it is a 30 minute one on one with your direct reports every week. And that's not about what did you do? What are you reporting? What are you delivering? It's their time. It's like, how's your cat? Do you have any questions? Are you wondering why? You know, what is how are you feeling about your career? How's your mom doing? I, I heard that, you know, I remember that she was having a hard time so that you can build those relationships so when there is a hard problem they will tell you they will communicate and engage with you um so so i think the good news is as you as we moved we, we've learned that of course you can do remote first you just have to bring more discipline precision and focus there is you have to write everything down there are things that used to be meetings that maybe should become a google doc uh, you need to restructure other meetings so that you can truly get the ideas and participation of all of those involved. So, Peter, Peter. <clears throat> yes. Are you saying that I can throw away my copy of the book called Management by Walking Around? <laughs> no, you should send it to me because I want to put it as the backdrop if I give another talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> And or, small anecdote. So when I was, I, I went, I did a degree in kind of computer and electronics engineering. I worked for GEC Microsystems, which back in 1988, when they first employed me kind of as a student engineer going through college, was primarily known for, if anyone remembers Minitel in France, it was like teletext systems. Uh, they built teletext systems. The problem was like their, their biggest clients in the late 80s were like Yugoslavia and I think Iran and like two or three, it, they, they were not in a growing business. But it was fascinating that I was actually asked to like prepare a little report at the end of the year and I went to the CEO and I'm like, dude, everyone thinks that all you're doing is walking around at five o'clock every night to see which butts are in seats. And he's like, well, I do. I'm like, that's probably not going to help you. You know, people can goof off sitting in front of a computer in the office as much as they can goof off at home. How about we try to align with their values and get them passionate so it's more exciting to add value to your business than it is to slide off a little bit early or for a smoke break. Okay, but um, let's say that I'm a manager of a smaller team. I'm not the CEO, I'm the manager of a smaller team. If I walk around and rummage through the lab and so on, having informal conversations, I will learn countless things that are just not brought up in formal meetings. And it's this informality that I'm having a hard time reproducing in the virtual world. I, and I think we all are like, I, I, by the way, this is, if anyone came here for the answers, I'm sorry, that's next month. I'm not sure who's oh, presenting no. it, but I, but I can't wait to find out. Um, I do not have the answers, but the, the things that I, I would say is that firstly, everyone's having a really hard time with this. Can you remember uh, back when we all thought it was a good idea to have uh, a, a drink up over Zoom? It was like, 
two months into the pandemic, everyone's like, hey, let's sit down in the evening with the same people who are on Zoom calls in all day and spend more time on a Zoom call. Well, for most companies, that's pretty much died by now. Uh, but I have seen companies do some interesting things. So some of the things that they're working on, for example, those, um, some companies do hubs. So they're like, hey, you know, we have a, a few people around Chicago and a few people in Minneapolis. So we're going to pay for a WeWork membership or we're going to pay for, you have to invite everyone to the lunch or the dinner or whatever it is. They don't all have to show up if they've got childcare responsibilities. Uh, you know, they have, they're concerned about COVID because, you know, comorbidities or other issues for them or people they live with. They don't have to show up. Like fun is not required, but you have to invite everyone within your hub. So hubs, I think, work. Something that I've seen people doing is uh, creating Slack groups for communities of interest around juggling, wine tasting, uh, taco making, and then giving money to each one of those communities. So, you know, you might not drink alcohol, so the wine tasting isn't super exciting, but it turns out that you're really into to taco making. So finding ways that people can engage with things that enrich their lives with people who they happen to work with. And I, I feel that that allows you to start to build, because the challenge is that you need to have transact support for transactional conflict, right? I need to be able to, if I'm working with Kimberly, I need to be say, Kimberly, you're amazing, but I got to say, I just don't agree with the, the page three of the report. I, I, I think your conclusions are wrong. Can we talk about that rather than being like, oh, Kimberly, you're awesome because I kind of don't want to make you unhappy. The challenge is, if all I ever do with Kimberly is tell her that I think her writing sucks, we're probably not going to get along pretty soon. So we need to have other ways to create these emotional relationships that are positive and supportive and reinforcing of the culture so that we don't uh, only have transactional conflict because then we're going to give up on transactional conflict because we don't want to lose our job or lose our team. Uh, so I think one element of it is, is building these cultural elements that allow you to make those connections. Another element is I think we absolutely have to disambiguate working remotely and working re home from home from working remotely and working from home during a pandemic. Because I've done both and they are totally different things. I used to work in the United Kingdom and most of my clients were in the States and most of my team was globally distributed and it was great. I would go to a coffee shop. I would hit the gym. I would like have a pastry with a couple of friends and then I'd start to get down to work mid morning. And by the time, you know, the, the East Coast was starting to come online, I'd already have like a chunk of work for them to look at. Um, I, I have not been going to the coffee shop or the pastries, or for drinks in the evening, or to the gym, or to anything else. I've been locked in the same four walls trying to avoid getting a, you know, get, be, becoming another statistic. And so both in terms of the stress levels and in terms of the socialization, we're dealing with something very different. Um, so I think that we're going to see as we hopefully move out of the, the pandemic phase of, of COVID-19, that we're going to start to bring no more normalcy to our lives, but that does not necessarily mean we're all going to return to an office. Uh, the one other thing I say that's worked for us very well is we, our daily stand up. We get on five minutes early if we feel like it and just chat. We absolutely make sure that we do special events every two months, but we take an hour out of the work day to uh, and it's it's at the end of the workday for the Ukrainians and the, we've got one person in Guatemala, uh, in uh, Nigeria. It's earlier in the workday for like our, 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 our Colorado and Guatemalan members of the team. But I could ask you if I could ask you. Um, you in. I have seen people attempt to schedule coffee chats and it, it sounds nice in principle, but in practice, the daily workload, the priorities, the latest fire that's burning, whatever else, those those coffee chats always get subsumed. And 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 how do you keep that informal social chat up when you've got the day-to-day -day distractions? So I, I think that you again, there, there's so many great points coming up here, and I'm just gonna kind of dive into something. I mean, the first thing is if you really can't find a few minutes to connect with another member of your team, and don't get me wrong, I have days, weeks, and sometimes months like that you're kind of doing it wrong. 
Our job is not to maximize the productive output of every single individual, but to maximize the capacity for shifting value and delivering units of value with a relatively small cycle time. And one of the things required to reduce cycle time, if you look at like lean principles, is you've got to have slack. Because if you're 100% utilized and something takes one hour longer than you expect, you're like, good news, I can get that done. Bad news, I can schedule it for December of next year. So this project is going to be sitting as work in progress for 18 months because I have no slack. If you have slack, there is usually the possibility to invest some of it. And then it's a values thing. There are very few people who say, you know, I'm just so busy at work as a programmer, I don't have any time to write code. I mean, what with setting up the computer and doing the one-on-ones and the management meetings. I mean, don't get me wrong. I actually know a lot of programmers who are in that position. <laughs> They're pulled into so many client meetings, they actually don't get to write code. But we also wouldn't accept that, right? If a, if a programmer said, look, I can do every aspect of my job, but like actually typing on the keyboard, I just don't have time for. You'd be like, okay, I, I feel like we need to talk about your values and priorities because if you're prioritizing meetings over writing code as an individual contributor, that's usually, with exceptions, not the right priority. And so yeah. the question is, how much do you value your team and the ability for you to productively engage with them? And, and let me just suggest something that I do in general with the meetings I facilitate, which is mostly uh, some project-based meetings or workshops or anything that I'm doing. I say, they're always gonna start with an icebreaker, which is gonna be some fun thing that I'm not gonna suggest. After the first one, one of you are gonna bring the icebreaker. So whatever stupid thing you want us to do, like you wanna play Wordle, bring Wordle, fine. But we're gonna have an icebreaker that's just for getting started. So the people who come five minutes late to the meeting only miss that. And then we're gonna do a check-in where we get into small breakout rooms with two, three, four people and talk about, yeah, my cat just died. I feel like crap. And I had to take care of my mother in her nursing home last week and get that off your chest. And if you can't spend the first 10, 15 minutes of your meeting doing that kind of check-in and some kind of, you know, then you're just not going to have people fully engaged. They're going to be checking their email. They're going to be texting. They're going to be doing all kinds of other things besides engaging and connecting with the content. Absolutely. Uh, Peter, I'm wondering if you've seen some of the dialogue coming by on the chat board. I, I must admit, I've been so focused on the, the conversation, I've not. So please, if anyone wants to bring things up, it, I'm not quite sure what the standards are here, but if, if people are okay with unmuting or if somebody else wants to, to shout it out, that'll probably be, be more effective if you don't Come on, mind. David. Shout out, David. Unmute yourself, buddy. Yeah, that's 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 crazy. We have uh, because thanks to Kimberly and a few of our leaders, we created. We are in the process of creating a, a, a global uh, nonprofit, uh, agile-minded project program managers, and we have now four uh, four Scrum team globally scattered, and we have uh, Scrum teams. Uh, a kind of weekly stand up. So we create this uh, ice breaking, just five minute aha moment, a uh, short, very short uh, uh, bullet item questions. And usually guess what? I am the coach, so I can't become an impediment. So I step in, in their way and they start kicking me around. And you know, that creates a, a, a kind of a human to human connection at virtual space. That is what we need to do. In, in Agile world, we try to be in person. So we, we love this in-person connection. We can duplicate that virtually. It's, it's up to us to open up and, and, and bring people together. And uh, we have fun, we, we laugh, we joke, we, we know about each other, uh, you know, they know that, uh, you know, what I'm doing, I know what they're doing, we're having fun, it's good, it's nice. And the, absolutely, I, I think it is so important to find the rituals that work for your team and to, honestly to support and allow your team to find rituals. You, you provide them with resources, but they've got to find what's authentic for them as a group, right? It's not like, you know, um, floggings will continue until morale improves right it's like you've, you've got to give people the space to find the ways they want to do it but it's also important to explain to and like 
especially when you're working with an engineering team, they're like, I got better things. I got, you know, I could go fix the issue with the, the Kafka, the Kafka like service. Like you could, but if everybody on the team hates each other, <clears throat> we're probably not going to keep shipping code effectively. So we've got to invest a little bit of time in, in our relationships. And quite frankly, it's only going back to the level of productivity we had in person. Imagine if people said in person, look, firstly, I don't have time to commute to and from the office. So everyone's just gonna have to come to my home. Secondly, I can't go like from one floor to another to a conference room. I mean, that takes time. I can't waste three minutes going between floors. I've got work <laughs> to do. Oh, and yet we've people. got all that time back. We now have to invest some of that in some of the things we might've done walking up and down the stairs, which is maybe talking to some coworkers. We've got some hands raised. So John, and also Cortland. So Jean first, please. Um, hi. So this is a very interesting topic. Uh, so regarding Slack, like what's a good percentage? Somebody on chat was saying he has like negative 5% Slack. So <laughs> even an eight hour workday, like how many hours would you say would be good mm. for Slacking? So, so I think that's a great answer. And I don't, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out some ideas, but I, I'd love to, to please other people come with different perspectives. I think it's very important to respect manager versus maker time. So if I'm running a team, it's probably a different percentage than if I'm an individual contributor on a team. And I think there's one of the biggest challenges we have. I do love some of the Cal Newport stuff around like, you know, deep work and the idea that we, we you really got to respect uh, maker schedules and give people the space to not be available. So I think there's actually real value in having Slack turned off a lot. Truth is, it only takes five minutes a day to make real human connections with other people on your team. They then become a whole other set of operational concerns that I think are somewhat independent of the, the remote versus in-person versus hybrid work question, which is simply, how do I want to balance for a particular role uh, response time with depth of work and focus that the person can provide. There are some people you should probably kind of lock in a room for three or four days and just not bother them because they're doing really deep algorithmic work and they kind of don't need to speak to other humans. And there are other people who maybe they do need to check Slack every 60 minutes or 90 minutes because if it takes them four hours to respond when there's an incident or an issue, then that could be a real problem and blocking other people. Um, and I think you also can like cycle through these roles, right? You have the king of developers who's responsible for, for dealing with outages and downtime and stuff like that. So other developers can take time to just do some deep work and focus on shipping code. Did that help to answer the question? And does yeah, anyone else? Yeah, no, it's, it's helpful to, to kind of, you have to like look at like what the situation is for the particular people, right? Yeah, makes sense. Anyone else have a different perspective on that? Please feel free to jump in. Well, Cortland has his hand up. Cortland. Yeah, yeah. I, I noticed that um, there's two different meanings to the word Slack time. Oh, sorry. I, I had assumed a piece of software being sold by a large tech company. Apologies yeah. if that is incorrect. <laughs> I was thinking of the other one where we do oh. also have Slack time in our schedules right right how, how how much slack if it go if it's going back to like the the work in progress uh, the the minimizing cycle time question i think what you can do i i, I think like i i used to be a lean geek so like i'm i'm really into like uh value stream mapping and looking at the the ratio of time where you are adding value versus waiting in queues and then determining um if you can change the amount of slack that certain individuals or teams have to materially reduce cycle time without having too much of an impact, a negative impact on, on the amount of productivity or functionality shipped. So I don't think I have a good percentage number and I'd love if anyone does. The number um, I've heard is 80%. If you're more than 80% scheduled, you're likely going to be doing so much task switching inefficiency and also just pure exhaustion. Um, that your productivity drops from a, to about 40%. So you have to work 10 hours to get four hours worth of work done. So it's the illusion of productivity. That sounds great. And, and the one other thing I realized, I feel like there might've been a chart on this. If anyone hasn't read it, um, there, there's a book recommendation. It is not a new book. So I apologize to many of you who already have read it. Uh, Don Reinertsen's excellent book on principles of product development flow. There are two reasons to read this book. One is if you've ever read any of the other lean books and you're like, yeah, but why does that work? He takes ideas from, you know, 
um, queuing theory and information theory, and he explains exactly why it works. So if you really want to understand Lean, it's an excellent series of essays. The other thing I'd say is if you ever have trouble with insomnia, take one chapter before bed at night. He is an amazing theorist. He could probably use a better editor. Uh, it took me a while to get through the book. Excellent though it was. I, I, so, I want, oh, sorry. oh yeah. So um, I also noticed that I'll, I'll, not only talking about our cats and our personal lives, but there's so much that goes on that's sort of half-baked and informal. So for instance, I'm working on a new technique for test-driven development, but I'm, it's still, it's sort of half-baked, but I need to, you know, it looks, it looks worthwhile. Or in my company, we, we have new products and we have a lot more uh, clients. So we need to work on tightening up our support procedures. But it's all sort of been loosey goosey before. We actually have to sit down and really think through this. Nobody's formally scheduled any of this. So it's all kind of, uh, uh, it's all kind of that informal water cooler chat just to do serious technical business. And, and I think it's important to schedule the stuff we lost, right? It's to take some of that time. I feel like I, I, in some ways I'm, I'm in this horrible product, horrible high productivity well, where I am so productive. I walk up two flights of stairs once, I sit here for about eight or 10 hours, sometimes I stand up. And the good news is I'm doing nothing but shipping value. The bad news is I'm 30 minutes from New York, but the thought of losing an hour and a half by the time you put it, for commuting just just to get in front of another human being to like meet with them to have lunch or to have coffee feels almost unimaginable and so i i actually need to reset my productivity expectations to about 70 percent of where i am now just in terms of volume of emails and stuff shipped because otherwise i'll never have the slack i'll never have that space for synchronicity or the opportunity to engage with other humans unless they happen to walk into my very small office well, I think the other thing about 80% or whatever is we have to recognize that our ability to estimate is classically bad, including our what we do during the day. Yeah. Because like 20% of stuff that I don't formally estimate, but is very real. If I were to actually sit down and do a log every five minutes, I would uncover all this stuff. But yeah, 20 or 30% of of unestimated, not explicitly recognized tasks, I think is pretty reasonable. Absolutely. It's just like we always would add 20 or 30% to an estimate because we always knew that we were, we were left stuff yeah. out. Right before you double it. And then, then, yeah, then, and then you double it. Okay, well. <laughs> I, maybe I was just worse at estimating. Um, I, I'm gonna take this a few other directions, but please feel free to pull it back or pull it in other directions. One thing I want to do, which is sometimes an easy win, I sometimes start one of these. I, uh, it's really interesting to me because when I speak to some engineering leaders, especially because so far all we've been talking about is remote. And one thing I do want to remind people of, one of the things that was magical, I had I built a remote first team of 50 for Flatiron School, a, a boot camp based out of New York City that taught people to become programmers. And we got to meet every three to six months. And it was absolutely magical. You re I really noticed a difference in the quality and uh, the tenor of the relationships on Slack, on Zoom calls after a three-day on-site or off-site versus before it. So remember, those are coming back. I've not spoken to any engineering leaders who's like, not only are we staying virtual, but we're never going to meet anyone, right? We're all planning to have generally for like smaller teams every three or six months perhaps for an all hands some companies are doing it some aren't and they're looking for at least you know every, probably once a year there are going to be opportunities to engage and interact in person that i think will a phrase i used to like was you know sus connect in person and sustain online and i really think that that's an important part of the long-term cultural alignment and relationship strategy which is you can bring human beings together in person again when it's safe even if they don't choose to live in the same place and even if you don't choose to do it five days a week 
So I think it's important to realize it's not an either or that you will always be a box on Zoom versus you have to be in the office five days a week. Something I, I'd love to ask about, like, does anyone have anything they want to share about hybrid? So uh, I, do you work at a company? Yeah, I'd like, um, and sorry, I'm going to catch names, Paul. Um, do you want to jump in and then David and anyone else who raised their hand, please jump in. A couple of things. Um, one is I'd be interested in kind of what the remote versus in-person ratios uh, companies are expecting. And I have some data. Uh, one of my uh, employees has a spouse who works for a Fortune 50 insurance company in the, uh, in the data center and uh, got wind of a survey that this big insurance company had done of their entire employee base to, towards the end of the pandemic. So it's just a few months ago. And they asked everyone in the company, do you want to go back to work you know, all the time? Do you want a hybrid model or do you want to be uh, remote only? And they, were, they, they did it to try and plan, right? They're looking at office space and trying to understand how much space they were going to need. And they were expecting to get, well, you know, maybe 50%, 25, 25, kind of into the three buckets. Only 2% said they wanted to go back full time. Only 20% said they wanted to go back in a hybrid way. And the rest, the vast majority, wanted to be remote only forever. So there is a, a, a pretty significant pushback around the return to work or business as usual. Uh, it, it is, we're going back to a new place. I don't know that we know what it looks like yet, but this is a topic that you, you are in more of these conversations than I am. I'd be very curious about where companies are, are coming, uh, coming back to. What does that look like? If, uh, and David, I know you wanted to say something, so please do before I. Yeah, I, I actually a couple of things. Uh, Paul, what you're saying is one of my uh, one of my uh, very close friend is is working at Oracle. Actually, three of them, and this guy is senior uh, senior developer, uh, architect developer, and he said that they had internal survey and they said that fifty six percent want to go back to work. That is Oracle here in, in, in Redwood Shore. Uh, Peter, you asked about the hybrid. Uh, I'm teaching at UCSC Silicon Valley Extension. I'm teaching at Northeastern University. Northeastern, I, I'm, I'm having a master's degree, a master of science in the project program management. All of my students are in person, all of them. They, we, we get together at downtown San Jose every Monday. And if I don't see them, <laughs> they get penalized, not that I penalize them, but that's how the system is. And that is one thing that uh, I, I've realized uh, the, the, the technology is advancing in that sense. And we used this hybrid in-person and visual setting at uh, PATCO, Professional Technical uh, Consultant Association here in Silicon Valley. And we created a couple of them. There are pros and cons. We need to be mindful of the voice uh, of, the, of the environment surrounding and how we behave for, for virtual folks. Otherwise, it is doable. It is it is good. It's nice to have people to get together. We are human beings. I want to see Kimberly and Ron and Peter and my folks, Joe and, and everybody. I need to see you guys. I have to see you in person and shake hand and hug you guys. Thank you. I, I, I think there's, there's so much great input there. So it's like a few things I'd say before the pandemic. Uh, I used to have a gym. My, my heuristic was I would usually only hire people for a remote role if they had previously had a remote role. Because my general heuristic rule of thumb, even for engineers, was about half of them, once they, once they learn that they can work from home, they're never going to want to go back into an office again. And about half of them, once they've been forced to work remotely, would take a pay cut to actually meet other humans again in the office. It, it was about 50-50. And I think that's changing now. I think there is still, uh, firstly, I feel sorry for the, the people who are just coming out of college. There are so many more things you get from work, especially straight out of college, than just a paycheck and a series of tasks to be completed. You get mentorship, you get a friend group. If you're coming in from, I don't know, Michigan State and you just moved to 
the mission in San Francisco, you might not know anyone there. And to have people that perhaps you can spend evenings with and perhaps play volleyball on the weekends, that's a really magical experience. And I don't think that's coming back the way that it was. And the reason for that is, I mean, I'm in a different place in my life now. I have plenty of friends online and in person. Most of my friends have always been geographically distributed around the world because I used to present a lot of conferences. So I was never going to be able to live near all my friends because that was no one place. But also I've got a kid. I love the fact that I can see my five-year-old when he comes home from school and I can like take him off to school without having to worry about whether I'll be able to take the train on time. For me, there's no world where I would go into an office full-time uh, or even part-time. And plenty of people are in the middle. They want three days a week. And I think that's perfectly valid. And we're going to have to figure out how to support all of those in a way that makes the in-office experience compelling without disadvantaging uh, the promotional prospects of the remote first folks due to proximity bias. Fair enough, though, uh, Peter, if I could just uh, uh, ask your comments on, on, on the following uh, theory. Um, you've made the observation that uh, there are countless uh, uh, individual contributors who who prefer to to work from home. Uh, there have been press reports about managers and vice presidents who want people back in the, in the building, mm -hmm. and and when you ask why, uh, what what one of the uh, allegations is, many of these vice presidents got to their role, climbed up the ladder, partly based on how they can read a room. Mm -hmm. Someone's giving a presentation and the VP's looking at the body language of the other people and figuring out who are the supporters and who are the detractors and so on. And this ability to read the room, to, to read beyond what the presenter is presenting, that is the social skill that, that helped them reach the VP level. And you put them behind a Zoom camera and they can't read the room. So they are being removed from their source of strength this this is the allegation now I'm, I'm running it past you does this make sense to you do you poke a bunch of holes in it what's what's your thought on that uh so i i i think that at a hot i don't know for sure i think at a very high level the more senior you are in management the more you're a politician just by its nature you are aggregating building consensus through groups of people and connecting with and engaging people to follow your vision, right? That's how you become director, VP, C-level executive is by getting people to believe and, and support and follow you and by building consensus amongst your peers and your, your, your the, the other people you interact with to, to move the business or your organization in a particular direction. So there's no question, uh, to me that it does not surprise me at all that more senior management firstly like some of us like myself they might be a little older so they might be a, some while there are plenty of people in their 80s who are phenomenally good at technology there are also people that there's they, there is some correlation between comfort with technology and age right generally a reverse correlation to some degree even though most of us are probably going to be exceptions to that reverse correlation Thank um you. And so given that, uh, it does not surprise me at all that there are many senior executives who are like, no, I just want to see, I want them in the room. I want to be able to sit. I don't know whether it's reading the room, but certainly they have a comfort level. They can build alliances and connections. They know how to work the, I mean, in a strange way, like how to, how to work like the lunch counter, right? They know how to engage with people and like a little bit of small talk here and a little bit of there to share the love. And so I understand why they want that to come back. Um, but I, I, I don't think that them wanting that to come back has anything to do with where the world is going. I don't think they're going to get that back in any scalable manner. I do believe if you're building a very small company, it's perfectly valid to say, we're gonna be remote first, we're gonna be in-person only, or we're gonna be hybrid. If you only need to hire 20, 50, 100, maybe 200 people, you can do that. Just be the best in-person experience. We're gonna be in downtown San Jose, where you know, we're gonna do the Google thing, right? We're gonna to cater the food and 
do your laundry and we're going to make it a wonderful place for you. We're going to have a disco in the evenings, whatever it is. We're going to make this the place you want to spend your life. You can get two to 500 people to do that. That will absolutely work. I'm not convinced that as you move beyond a certain scale, I don't know what the magic number is, 500, 5,000 employees, that you will continue to be able to get all of the competencies you need at the prices you can afford within commuting distance of a single campus. Um, and then there's a distribute, there's the true distributed, but in office only strategy, and that's possible. But I don't think large companies are going to be successful if they try to bring every single person back into the office. Um, I think equally uh, at that scale, you will not be six. I don't believe per this is personal belief. I have nothing to back this up. I personally do not believe you'll be successful remote only beyond a certain scale. I don't know if it's a thousand employees, 5,000 at some point in time, some subset of the people you want to hire are going to want to hang out with other humans and are going to want an office experience. So I think the biggest companies are going to be forced to do hybrid for better or worse. The smallest ones I, I think can pick a lane if they choose to do so. And I think that's a perfectly valid approach. Um, Cortland. So I see the hand raised. Yeah. <clears throat> so I've been wondering for years whether we're going to have a, a, a growing recognition of the value of more explicit uh, verbal and written communication. I think but to go to what you're saying, um, that's a skill that has to be developed and it's not easy. I also suspect that at better levels, and I'm talking about the kind of levels that a very good uh, mentor or therapist or coach can operate at, uh, that that really requires a personal shift, uh, a develop, you know, on the, on some scale of adult developmental psychology, social, emotional, cognitive, it's gonna, it, it kind of gets personal. It's personal growth. Um, and then I suspect what may come around after all of that, after we get really good at explicit communication, is that we're gonna get mature enough so that we really are going to wanna to hang around in person too. So I, we're not, I, it's not gonna be either or, but it, we will get to have to be some hybrid of both. Cause I, I do wanna hug you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can the, say that now, Mm -hmm. as a person on the spectrum, mm -hmm. because I've done a lot of personal work and therapy and Buddhist practice and things. So I've developed to now say, uh, yeah, I would like to hug you. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have said that when I was in my 20s. Absolutely. The, the thing you might have to accept, and I'm going to go to Kimberly in just a second, is that you, you can hug me, but it might have to be once a quarter because I, something that's super important to me is, is having a horse ranch in Montana, but I still want to work on the code base. And I feel that it, we are going to increasingly ha all have more deep, strong personal and professional relationships with people who don't happen to consistently live within computer distance of us. And I think that's going to be okay. Uh, Kimberly, I see you. Uh, hand up. I I, I'm, I am a physicist by education and I work in, you know, the human skills area. And um, so I had to learn all this the hard way because I wasn't great at human skills when I first started in my engineering career. I did hardware, software, firmware systems. And I will just tell you this, <clears throat> big, strong, successful, well-educated professionals do not go to their managers and say, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I'm lonely, I'm struggling but they are to the tune of about half of them are. And they tell me that's partly how I know because now I do the work that's called touchy feely crap by my engineering friends, but these people are struggling. And uh, the latest estimates I've seen is that over half of Americans have some kind of mental health issue and maybe 10 or 20% are like hugely diagnosable. And I'm one of them. I'm anxious, I'm struggling, I'm depressed. And I, I am doing everything I can to try to help everyone else. but Today, somebody, somebody that I know through the business world sent me a pot of flowers that says, you have a special way of making the world a better place. Oh my God, just to get something that says somebody noticed. 
thank you. And then someone else wrote me a letter about how positively I'd impacted him during the pandemic. I've got it hanging right here in my living room. These are meaningful and important for people, technology people included. And isn't it great that they managed to hug you without actually coming to your location? So I guess that there's a lot of different types of hugs that we're going to be learning about over time, not all of which require physical proximity. And Mark has his hand up. Mark. Yes. So I just want to add one more comment in there, too, is that for many been working in, quote unquote, remote situations, even locally. Uh, so quite often you're not seen when you're working in the lab and not in your office. Absolutely. And, and that's something that we forget to do to check in with those that even locally are working remotely. And or it can even be, I mean, there, there was, um, I forget that there, there was a, a, a rule or a law that was talking about how quickly the, the likelihood of a conversation between two people in the same office drops off as a function of the oh. distance between the desks. And yeah. basically you, you go down and I think I probably got this from Kimberly. Thank you so much. And it was like, I think like you go down a floor or like to the next building over and you're basically probably never going to speak with each other. Uh, so it's important which, to realize. Which is, also, which is also why my normal is I don't pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. I go to the person and talk to the person. Nice. Bes besides good exercise, yeah. uh, it, it means then that I'm seen being active with others rather than just, you know, Oh, I can save a minute here or a minute there just by picking up the phone. No, I think that investment in, and it's, it's fundamentally higher bandwidth communication, right? You know, low bandwidth communication would be typing. You get a little more if there's an audio stream, a video stream adds to it, but physically being in the same space as another human adds additional levels of, of, of communication. So yeah, that's incredibly important. And at Thank the same so time, much, you're directing 60 people in Brazil and never <laughs> get there. Well, and like, so let, let's go there for a second. So the question then becomes geographic reach. I think we have, d despite the naysayers who are like, we could never work from home. Like, I mean, there, there were literally companies that were like, no, no, we couldn't work from home. And well, that was two years ago. And so, so clearly we can, at least in, in some way. Um, but then if you don't need people in the office, why do you focus on hiring people within a 20 minute commute of that location? And if you're going beyond that, how far beyond do you go and why? Uh, and Kimberly. Yeah, and one of in. my clients in Houston, uh, now this is an executive at a big company that's a Japanese company and he's a Japanese person. But beginning of the pandemic, March or April, he said, well, we'll work from home, but um, as soon as the pandemic's over, everybody will come back. And then a few months later, he said, well, we'll work from home, but we're going to have them come back based on whether or not they need to be in the office to do their job. I mean, it took months for that realization to sink in. That, that you don't have to force people to commute yeah. just because they can. <clears throat> Right, but but uh, Peter, well, I I oh, sorry, Ron, I, I see your hand up, but I'll just throw this out. If I go back to pre-pandemic times, around 2015, give or take, I saw one study about work from home, um, and what they came down to is again, what is the nature of the job? And a perfect example, travel agents, and by the way, there still are travel agents. Uh, they they can perfectly work from home and they could back in 2015 because they did not need to interact with their colleagues that much. They would interact with the person buying the ticket, but not with their colleagues. So colleague to colleague interaction was low for travel agents. Therefore, that was okay work, work from home. So that's what the situation was around like back in 2015. Now, I, I guess it comes down to how much do you need to interact with your colleagues. If, if you're in a tremendously interactive environment, maybe there's a role for being on campus. 
I, I think that you're going, I mean, I, I would not accept the, the, the premise that just because you need to interact with your, your coworkers, that that's necessarily justifies everyone being, I, I think that's one dimension, right? There's no question it's, it's higher bandwidth communication. It's easier to get the, the, the cultural, the sense of connection. There are absolutely benefits for being in person. Uh, but what happens if the best person for the job lives a thousand miles away and doesn't want to relocate. I mean, they're just phenomenally better or has kids and wants to be able to drop them off and pick them up from daycare or has some other reason not to choose to want to spend three hours of their life every, every day in a car stuck in traffic on, you know, one oh one. Um, these are all we, I'm sorry. I, I feel like I, I've, we've been totally ignoring one. So please Ron, come on in. Yeah. Uh, Peter, you were just bringing up, um, how how far geographically can we be from each other? Mm -hmm. And uh, and John, I think this this goes partly to what you're asking as well. The base camp folks say um, you better have, and I think their number is four. You better have four hours of time zone inter, uh, time zone overlap uh, mm -hmm. on your teams. John, to your to your comment, um, software development is a team sport. Um, we, we, we need to interact with each other. And so how much do we need to interact with our colleagues? Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the airline reservation business. I'm in the software development business and, and we need to, we need to interact. And so I'm, I'm with the base camp folks of saying, um, co-location now means <laughs> co-location doesn't mean we're in the same place. It means we've got time zone overlap with each other. And I, Peter, you've got time zone. I think you've got time zone inter, over, um, uh, overlap with Ukraine. Yep. Uh, in yep. New York, because you're in New York. Here mm -hmm. in California, we don't. Right. Uh, so, and nor do we ignore. And, and actually, California is a tough spot because we don't have much overlap with anybody outside the North America. And That's South America and Central, Central America. <laughs> so I, I didn't hear what you said, Kimberly. That's why tomorrow I'm going to wake up at 2.30 in the morning and work between 3 and 7 a.m. Because I have clients in Europe and Asia who want to be during the day and don't want to be up at those hours. Yep. Right. So I'm going to raise a, a whole set of things about geographic reach just to kind of like get them out all out on the table and we'll see where the discussion goes. Uh, Ron, firstly, uh, I do agree that within specific teams, hours of overlap are important. You need to have a thoughtful conversation about whether that is time zone overlap or working hour overlap. There are mm -hmm. risks to it, but there are genuinely people in Ukraine that actually like getting up or maybe Ukraine right now, by example, in Poland, who, who are quite happy to start working at noon and to work until eight or nine in the evening. And that is, gen now there, there's all sets of questions about, is that sustainable? What happens when they have a family? Like, are they really going to have to do that for months? Or are they gonna get fed up with the fact they can't work in the evenings? Uh, they can't, you know, play in the evenings or do other things. But I absolutely have worked with programmers who love to work hours that are not close to the regular nine to five. And sometimes that can help to get your overlap hours, even though your nominal time zone overlap hours don't match. So, so, so that's one family, thing. Families come along, they, they, they're they accidental sometimes as opposed to planned. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of, uh, I want to bring in um, um, Reed Hoffman's book, mm -hmm. The Alliance, in which he proposes that most of, no, all, virtually all of our, all of, all of what we do when we go recruit people, is, is virtually a lie. Mm -hmm. We make believe that we're going to hire you forever. And you make believe that you're going to come work for us forever. And both of those are lies. And, and Reed just lays that out there and says, so instead of that, let's have, and, and he started this at LinkedIn, let's have a tour of duty. Mm -hmm. Let's say for the next three years, you know, are you okay with working though? And so specific to, to your question, Peter, are you okay for the next three years working those hours? Because that's a, that's a commitment. Mm -hmm. You're going to commit to me to work to to work those hours for the next three years. And I'm going to commit to you to do my best to grow you to the the to 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 support you in your growth to the uh, to the to the level and the role that you want to get to over the next three years. Absolutely. And I think that's a great point. So I, I think you absolutely can have tours of duty where some people choose to work 
what is not a, a traditional set of hours. And in fact, there, there are many people who choose for a substantial part of their life to work earlier in the morning or later at nights because it's just a better fit for, for their lifestyle choices. So I think you need to think about time zone alignment, but be aware that you might not have geographic time zone alignment, and that's not an absolute blocker. You can still find people who will comfortably be a fit. Uh, the other thing is legal, especially as your company gets bigger. I was talking with the CTO of Harry's, the, uh, the shaving people, and one, they're not going public, but you know, they're at a size where that, that could be something in the foreseeable future. And one of the challenges they, they were saying was legal. But now that you've got global PEOs, like professional employer organizations, there's the, uh, in short, they will take care of all the paperwork so that you are legally hiring people and following all of the required work practices for whatever um, country they they are in or state they're in for that matter if you if you're doing multi-state with you know just works or somebody like that in the states so between uh, peos and the the kind of time zone flexibility there's a lot of places you can hire people and, and i'm noticing that it's happening during the pandemic we had uh an engineer and we had to double his salary in Ukraine because he was he was you know just going from like junior mid to mid senior so there was a competence growth but it was just the fact that, that I've seen insane salary inflation around the world now that American companies are realizing that they don't need to limit their hiring to people who can drive into the office every day it and and it's all just one final thing and then I'll, I'll throw it back to whoever's in the mood um it's also a challenge. I mean, luckily, for better or worse, you're already most of you're in Silicon Valley, so you're already competing with fan companies. But it's fundamentally going to change the experience as more of those large venture backed, very profitable big tech companies start hiring in places they haven't. And it's going to shake up, I think, a lot of other job markets, both within the US and globally. Uh, I was speaking with the CTO of uh, Greenhouse, Mike. Um, oh dear, that, that's embarrassing. Please cut that part from the recording. Um, but but I, sorry, it's like almost 10 o'clock at night here and I was up a little early this morning. Uh, the one thing I say is that when I was chatting with uh, Mike Buford, he, he was saying like, at some point in time, we're going to come pretty close to a standard rate. Why would you pay somebody a different rate based upon where they happen to live? You pay them based upon the value that they deliver. And if you don't, somebody else will. I was speaking to another uh, director of engineering who really didn't want to get into the topic because they had geographic based comp. And I'm like, great. So if I've got somebody who moves from Montana to San Francisco and then back again, you're going to give them 30,000 bucks a year more to do the same job and then dock their salary by 30,000 bucks a year to do the same job afterwards. Good luck retaining that talent. And did that person then talk about the legal issues? Because my understanding is when that person goes from San Francisco back to Montana, we have to be careful because now every subsequent person hired in, in Montana, if you don't give them the rate of that guy who had come back, you're now doing differential pay. And if there's a gender involvement, a race involvement or anything else, you've just shot yourself in the foot with lawsuits. So if that person goes back to Montana and retains the San Francisco salary, everybody in Montana has to be paid the San Francisco salary or you're in a lawsuit trouble. Yeah. Or you, you can just try to explain why you're paying him 30,000 bucks a year less to do the same job. <laughs> and the way Facebook has claimed that they're going to do it is they're going to say, yes, we do have geographic based payment there. Your cost of living in Montana is lower. Uh, and and the base pay rates are lower that's why and that's wonderful because then the top three percent of facebook talents can get picked up by people who pay san francisco rates irrespective of geography except for the ones who live in the bay area yeah right i mean uh, that, it's a great way to lose your best talent i mean it's like in 2016 i was i i'd had a startup in new york city i had like raised a million dollars hired a team crashed and burned i'm like okay i need a job um, so I, I sent an email to a bunch of friends. I'm like, look, here's the deal. I'm moving to Boulder, Colorado from, from New York. I want to work in either San Francisco or New York. Uh, I'm not going to get on a plane more than twice a year. Uh, and I want to work in this particular field go. And I got about, yeah, I got plenty of job offers. 
at a, a New York salary, which was was fine for me. Um, if you, I had a, a particular brand, so it was easy for me. But competence will out, and eventually, the best engineers are going to get paid San Francisco salaries wherever they live, because that because if one company doesn't offer it to them, another one will. There's an arbitrage. Because if I'm paying San Francisco rates to everyone, I don't. As long as I can get maximum, as long as I can get utility from them, I really don't care where they live. David has his hand up. Oh, sorry, David. Yeah, actually, I'm going to kind of, uh, with your permission, Peter, uh, I'm going to kind of shift this to what's happening and what what in the past two plus years have brought us to here. Uh, the pandemic has created this big chaos. And that chaos is in, in, in among especially uh, the professionals have created this mixed match of what we want, what we don't want, harder work, lower work, uh, what kind of in-person or not. And that chaos uh, is, we, we are in a, a, a bit agile mindset. We are in the process of understanding what is the cause effect of it and how we can minimize the, uh, the uh, side effects, all these uh, high percentage of uh, psychological disorders that have been coming up surface and how we want to manage all these uh, anomalies that created by this pandemic, so to speak. And we're learning how to, how to manage things and how to think collaboratively uh, by thinking, by bringing different aspects of humanity to come out of this chaotic place or chaotic situation environment, move at least towards the uh, complexity and uh, bringing it to kind of simplified version. So we're going to have this kind of conversation coming up and again. And I'm thinking if we could learn from each other how we can overcome all the negative side effects of uh, environment created by pandemic, this complex, chaotic uh, situation. That would help us all. Absolutely. Ron has his hand up. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> there's an interesting side effect to paying everyone the same salaries. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is that that works for uh, global products, but local companies doing local products with, and uh, Scott just pasted a comment relative to this into the chat saying prices, uh, uh, the, the, the salaries, prices, levels are disparate. You know, if you've got a company, so I'm, I'm, um, I've got a client that's in, uh, in banking in the Caribbean and uh, they're, I mean, they, they don't expect to be profitable in the same way that a bank in New York is or a bank in San Francisco is. But their programmers are sitting in coffee shops next to people who are now working for Facebook. Yeah. And they're going to lose their best programmers. I mean, we yes, are moving. They are, they are losing their best programmers. And, and then I think it brings up one other thing, which I'm just going to add on top of this so we can then, again, take in any direction we want, which is the great resignation. And I think it's important to realize, firstly, that supply and demand for engineers, I think, on a global basis continues to be out of whack. There's just more software we could write than we have people to write it. And there's mitigating factors, right? We're, we're trying to push more people through degrees. We've got boot camps now to, to re retrain people. Um, we've got low code, no code solutions, which are trying to take some of that, you know, departmental intranet and small like workflow apps off of professional full-time programming teams. So, so we, we're trying to mitigate it, but there's still supply and demand's out of whack on a global basis. So I think we're going to continue to see on a compensation side, the, the very best engineers are going to continue to, to make more money, especially if they don't happen to be in a in a hot, you know, in San Francisco or or New York already, if they're in Ohio, they've they've got a lot of upside. Um, 
But then it's also important to realize that there are many reasons. Uh, Oliver Hurst Himmel is a friend who is a CTO at Donors Choose, and he runs a, a group called CTOs for Good. There are many reasons that we choose to work. Compensation is one of them, recognition, people leave their managers, not their companies, mission alignment, uh, work flexibility. And I think as companies, we're all going to be challenged to do a better job on us, our sum of those dimensions. You can make it easy, just pay somebody a million bucks a year and you can kind of be miserable at everything else. And a certain subset of great programmers will be very happy with that. Uh, but the, the sum of those, I, I think you need to manage and figure out whether you're staying competitive on a global basis. Now, Peter, uh, about half an hour ago, you spoke about the keyword, the proximity effect. And in the chat, we just had a note from Jeanne, and she's asking, uh, what are the benefits of staying in SF? And I'm wondering if you can expand on the proximity effect and if you think that's going to continue going forward. Uh, so I, it's a great question. I mean, some of the benefits, of course, of staying in San Francisco is that it's it's a beautiful place with wonderful recreation and an amazing bridge and great food and uh, some degree of cultural diversity. There, there, there are lots of reasons you can choose to live in San Francisco. The question is whether uh, there is going to be, you're probably going to be a little better off a little easier if you choose to move to Montana, right? If, if you've got the kind of job and if you are willing to be remote most of the time, you're probably going to be able to arbitrage that for, for a good period of time until Montana is just as expensive as the mission. What about the interactions? Like I, I go to Box and Woodside and I see people doing venture capital deals and I I know, you know, 50,000 people here who are smarter than me. And I met the guy who designed the computer mouse and, you know, things like that. You can't get that in Montana. Well, firstly, if 10% of them move to Montana, you, you can, you might, you, there might actually be enough <laughs> there, to, you know, they, 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 turns out that maybe the person who invented the computer mouse really loves horse ranches, in which case you might meet them in Montana. Um, the other things I would say, you're absolutely right. And like when I was, every time I go to San Francisco, I'm always in a coffee shop meeting a few people. I think there is a reason why founders continue to move to San Francisco. It's still, I mean, like New York is great. And like, I, I've been very involved with the New York startup ecosystem for many years, but it's still not San Francisco. It's different. Um, that said, just because the, the CEOs there, and yes, it's easier to do the venture deals and the partnerships and all the other stuff, doesn't mean your dev team needs to be there. And uh, you do need a sufficient community, either in person or through some combination of in-person and online to be acceptable and enjoyable. You can move to Austin, right? I mean, there are, uh, um, you know, there are political and legislative things you have to think about when you move to, to the state of Texas. Um, but if you're comfortable with those, it is a place that has, you don't need to have all the engineers, you just need to have enough of them. I've, I've presented at Ruby meetups in, in Austin years ago, and it was still so, great. So are you saying there is no proximity effect going forward? No, I'm saying, so the, 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 I think there is a proximity effect. I think it will generally start to attenuate for many roles, positions, and types of businesses. Um, the biggest challenge for me with proximity effect is how do we think about equity? How do we create a really good, if you're gonna have an in-office culture, have a great one, right? Have a wonderful place for people to be and connect and engage. But at the same time, how do we make sure that we bring the rigor to our promotional processes that we are hopefully starting to bring to our hiring processes for say, you know, ethnic and gender diversity to make sure that proximity bias is not a substantial part of the promotional effect. And I've spoke to a number of engineering leaders who say, yeah, we have rubrics or I don't even get to pick who gets promoted. We have a committee and we have at least one remote person on the committee so they can't have the proximity bias. And I think that we're going to see a lot of literature and a lot of recommendations about bringing more rigor to, uh, to pro to promotion to reduce, because otherwise the problem is going to be that the director is going to promote the manager who's in the office, not the manager right. who's in Montana. 
that's the problem. And that's what John has to face. John, if you want to leave the San Francisco area, make sure you work for a place that has disciplined management, according to what Peter had just said. And, and the good news is, if you don't have disciplined management, you're going to lose some of the best talent who, who see the inequities and will not put up with it. Uh, and so I think over time, there will be a, a very strong forcing function. If you want to attract and retain the best remote talent, you're going to have to bring that discipline to your promotions because they're not going to stay if they can't progress in their career just because they don't live down the street. And <laughs> Cortland has his hand back up again. Yeah, I, I wonder, you were talking, Peter, about um, the, the demand for talent globally mm -hmm. exceeding supply, which, of course, is great if you have the talent. <laughs> uh, I, of course, and I think of terms of software because that's what I do. I, I assume this also applies to other engineering disciplines, hardware engineering. I would assume for instance, or I, no. I don't know. You don't I, know. You're a software, too. Yeah, I, well, I used to be. Now I'm a party planner. I'm not sure quite what went wrong. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, 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 know okay. there, I know there are people who go into labs and uh, John, uh, you've, got a, you've got a company that's half hardware. Uh, people, people go into labs and, and people have to be proximate in order to, in order to do that and, and have been working in labs throughout the pandemic. Yes. Some or many of them. Well, I actually remember I live next door to a guy and he had to go down into San Jose at least once or twice a week because he had to buy, get more parts to you know, bring, bring electronic stuff back so he could work on it at home. But it does seem uh, that there are these uh, economic assumptions that we have both about cost of living, say, within a country, but also globally. I mean, do you expect that there would be differences? Uh, hey, I could get this smart guy from India for much less, but you're suggesting that uh, that uh, it's all based on assumptions that don't necessarily apply. I, I mean, and those guys from India aren't going to be much less for much longer. Yeah, exactly that. And there, there will be there is there is a cost associated with having to deal with global hiring. There's a cost associated mm -hmm. with the difference in time zones, and there is a cost with the extra precision required to manage remotely and the fact that if you want to do like hey let's just get together around a whiteboard at some point you now have to plan three months not three hours in advance and so all of those will can will provide some delta i don't think that the the great engineer in bali is necessarily going to be making you know six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year but i think those deltas are going to change over time and Paul, what I sorry. what the what I wonder is, uh, see, I see this in in my organization, which is all virtual, has been for years. Um, but there's still a reluctance to just place a call to somebody, you know. And I realized I spend so much damn time um, composing emails when I just should get on, and. And it's funny because I do not hear this distinction, but there is such a thing as a conversation, which means an interchange, which means, which means that a disciplined email communication would have be relatively short and in a question or proposition inviting feedback. And there would be many exchanges of these. And yet there, there is a culture of email which argues for the opposite that says that that process is bad. Uh, so there's that factor and there's the, just pick up the, you know, it's so easy with these various Zoom, you know, we've got it all programmed in on our Microsoft Teams and we just press a button and see if someone's available. But even I feel reluctant about doing that. Well, I think there needs to be an explicit, we need to have an explicit conversation about this. I think we no. need to keep having these explicit conversations about working styles, and I'm not sure what the answers are, because again, there becomes a trade off. The interesting thing about a phone call is it, it can be seen as a power dynamic. It's like I am saying it's more important for me to get an answer than for you to finish whatever the line of code you're working is. Mm -hmm. So it, it is interruptive of people who are on a maker schedule, and sometimes that's appropriate and sometimes that's not. 
And I think we're going to have to get better. It's like simple things like signaling in Slack, right? Managing your status and using that. And it's maybe the, the rule is simply if, the, if their status is busy, uh, then we're not going to do a huddle or, or a call or whatever it is. If their status is like something intermediate, maybe we'll send a Slack message or a Teams message to ask if they're available. And if their message is available, then we're just going to press the button and chat with mm -hmm. them. But, but I, I think we need to continue to build those norms. And I, and I don't think they need to be global norms, but we need to have those conversations so that teams can find the norms that work for their personalities and also for the, the profile of the work they're trying to ship. Well, I know for my company, I've been documenting uh, when people prefer to be available. And we have some people who've just said, you know, I like to do my concentrated work in the morning. Between one and three, I'm available for questions. Okay, uh, and thanks for that. Now, Paul has his hand up, but I first want to give the five minute warning. So uh, five more minutes and, and now Paul. I, I wanted to, I just wanted to return to one thing. First of all, a basic with respect to all these different forms of communication that I think we could all need to remember. I'm, I'm in a communi technical communication business and all effective communication begins with empathy. So before you send the Slack message or the email or make a phone call, think about the other person and where they're at and then choose the right medium and, and kind of come to meet them where they are. That'll, that'll help. It doesn't matter what channel you're using. Uh, but I wanted to return to something that you said earlier about the discipline required uh, with respect to man helping manage the careers of remote people to make sure they're considered. I, I think another dimension of that might be just being transparent about what, what the paths are like, right? I mean, if, you have, if you're building a corporate office uh, and you're, you're looking to promote from within and you wanna to get to see and know people that you're gonna entrust with more responsibility, I, I think it's probably possible just to say that and say, you know, if you wanna climb the ladder in this company, you're probably gonna to need to be here because those are the people that are gonna have the relationships that can ascend in our organization. But a lot of people don't wanna do that. They're, they're very happy being individual contributors and, and, and climbing the level of technical or, or uh, seniority within a specific profession. And I think if that's possible to do remotely, then I think that's probably a, a more realistic goal. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, uh, I'd be interested in what your thoughts are on that front, and especially the kind of the discipline that you're talking about. I, I think it, it's a great question. And I mean, this is obviously this predates the pandemic. I had a, a good friend who works at Microsoft and he lived in New York. He was relatively senior and he's like, look, so I've got to decide if I want to get any more senior, I'm moving my family across the country because I'm not going to get beyond a certain level of seniority in a certain area in that particular company. Mm -hmm. um, I, but what that means is, of course, Microsoft then if, if, if he wants to grow and he doesn't want to go, that means he's going to go find a job elsewhere and they're going to lose many years of experience because they didn't make that other option available. I think that what's great is talent is continuing to get more options and you need to think about the kinds of people you want to attract and retain and make sure that you are honest with them about what the limitations are. Um, but but understand that there's going to be a cost to that in terms of your your talent retention strategy. Okay, hey, we got time for one more question. Going once, Peter. I I think you absolutely amazed and astounded us. Uh, you did a great job, and and you kept the conversation going. Thanks everyone so much for like sharing the wisdom and insights and experiences. I always love how much I, I learn from these groups and kind of bringing the insights from one group along to the next. So thanks so much for, for hanging out and, and spending some time today. It was great and to it, meet you all. If you want to have some really great insights, go to one of Peter's CTO connections. Uh, they have all kinds of topics, not only technical, they've had me on there as a speaker. So the human skills are included in the things that he is helping bring to the CTO communities. And Ron too, thank you so much for also being a speaker. And, uh, and, and Peter, thank you for prompting this. Um, you, you facilitated and prompted this conversation that has grown so rich. So thank you for doing that. It's amazing that we could attract him. We had over 40 people sign up. So I know that if we send out a link to the recording, we'll have other people who couldn't make it that will take advantage of this. 
Thank you. And um, oh, John, people are asking me questions about when are we ever going to meet in person at Varian again? Right. Thanks Next month. That. Next month. Well, well, okay. We so because our speaker said he can't do it if it's in person. Well, uh, but what I can say is um, uh, the Varian executives are watching Santa Clara County uh, rules and whatever else. At present, now they came up with a cute word repopulation. I, I never hadn't heard that word before, but we're going to be repopulating the buildings in in early April. Now, uh, that suggests to me that probably by the third Thursday of May, things will have settled to the point that I can definitely book our, our old place again. Unless, of course, BA becomes the next Omicron. Uh, BA too. Yes, you're right about that. Now, uh, uh, Ron, I, I guess we can stop stop the recording now. I, I just want to say uh, this is also the time that that we typically shift over to uh, jobs. Um, uh, Peter, you, one of our uh, 